Welcome to everyone who has just dialed in to uh, another stay at, at home with Quendo. We have been running a few of these sessions and in light of Adeno Awareness oh. Month, we thought we would bring in the Adeno God, that is Graham Trunk. <laughs> Hi, Nicole. I'm just going to mute you and, um, and have any questions answered uh, that you might have. So welcome, Graham, and thank you for your time um, in coming on tonight. Yeah, pleasure. So just while you're still there, uh, I'm not quite sure mm -hmm. to do this, but I was planning on giving a brief overview of what Apple Notes is all about, simply treatment for that sort of thing, and then and then take some questions. Is that okay? Absolutely. Fantastic. Okay. So is everyone dialed in that's going to dial in? I can only see three or four picks at a time and yours. Do you want to yeah. number or not? Uh, no, I think I think we should start. Right. Okay. So, hello, everybody. Uh, Graham Tronk is my name. Um, I'm a gynaecologist in Brisbane. I've got a special interest in endometriosis, and more recently, probably equally interested in adenomosis. So, um, some of you will know what endometriosis is. Some of you will know what adenomosis is. Some of you won't know much about either of these conditions. I'm assuming that everyone knows that endometriosis is where the lining of the uterus basically grows outside the uterus, but inside the abdominal cavity, uh, usually, although there are other spots that can grow. Uh, and you may or may not even have heard of the word adenomosis. So adenomosis is has been has been recognised uh, since the late 1800s. It's with all we've known about it. Um, but half of the information that you'll read about it still and hear about it is all wrong. And I'm pretty passionate about getting it right uh, for women so that the length of time they suffer for is, is drastically decreased. So adenomosis is a bit like endometriosis in the muscle of the uterus. There are some differences, but they used to say that endometriosis was external endometriosis, in other words, external to the uterus, and adenomosis was uh, internal endometriosis. In other words, it's endometriosis in the muscle of the uterus. So <clears throat> that's, a, that's a, a small definition, like it's endometriosis in the muscle of the uterus or endometrium in the muscle of the uterus. Now, the problem, my problem is that um, I almost every day see new women who say that they've been here, there and everywhere to um, clinics, outpatient appointments, emergency um, rooms, uh, GPs and gynecologists. And they, they may have had a, a diagnosis of endometriosis, if they're lucky, but many of them haven't had a diagnosis of adenomosis at laparoscopy or scan, et cetera. So that kind of hurts me as a doctor that it's been around for a long time and people just don't pay attention to the fact that it even exists. Some doctors I've heard even have to Google it, which is scary. So the symptoms of adeno, they're varied and there's a lot of them and not everyone gets the same symptoms. So. You can you can add you can have all the symptoms of of endometriosis and then and add some right? so the symptoms of endometriosis are um, painful periods heavy periods clots flooding sometimes pain with intercourse sometimes bowel pain bloating you know the endo belly um, sometimes irritable bowel like syndrome um, and I say like on purpose um, uh, bladder symptoms frequency of urine um, et cetera, et cetera. Specific ones that I always ask for, for about if I'm wondering whether the patient may have endometriosis and adenomosis or even adenomosis by itself, because either one of these diseases can exist by itself. Uh, do you have low back pain? Usually cyclically, initially anyway. So pain referred to the lower back. And do, do you as a patient have pain which goes down one or both legs? So those two, symptoms of back pain and pain down the legs. It's a little bit peculiar to adenomyosis. It's a referred pain. Why, why it's in those regions, um, I don't know. I mean, and I don't think anyone really knows. But you can get um, fatigue, you can suffer uh, mood swings, you can get depressed. Now that may not be a symptom of adenomyosis, but you're probably depressed 
um, you know, because you haven't had a, a diagnosis given to you. Um, <clears throat> now, I also see quite a few second opinions, like through you guys and word of mouth and Facebook pages and Abnormals Australia, Abnormals Australia Facebook. Um, and people will come to me and say, I've had one or two laparoscopies and they did find endometriosis, but nothing really changed. In other words, the symptoms can continue um, despite having an endometriosis and despite having um, a diagnosis made of, of endometriosis. So like what's going on? And one of the first things I, I ask patients for is do they have any pictures of their operation? And, and not infrequently, I'll see a picture of the uterus that has, has all, the sim all the things that I look for in laparoscopy after I've, after I've um, you know, you look for endometriosis and you look for adenomosis and laparoscopy. And, and I'll be able to see on tiny photocopied color pictures almost the, the, the things that I look for at a laparoscopy if I do it myself. And the sort of things that, that I commonly see where the patient has had a misdiagnosis or a non-diagnosis of adeno will be a slightly bigger uterus, but not always so. I know that you're supposed to have a, a bulky uterus, but that's not always so, but usually a bit of a bigger uterus, a bumpy uterus, right? So that's not a medical term, but it does appear more bumpy, um, particularly on the back wall of the uterus where adenomosis changes are more common. Um, uh, and I've, I've named a term, I've actually coined a term, trunks tubal sign, not because I want to be famous, because I want someone to say, ah, oh, that's what that guy's talking about. So that's a sign where the, where that I look for, that's another sign of something you see rather than a symptom. So where the tube joins onto the uterus, uh, that, part of, that part of the anatomy is thicker. It's just thicker and it's whiter. And it looks, look, and it's just like telltale. It's almost telltale symptom of, of that we're gonna find out no most just later. The other, and, and I used to look at uteruses years and years ago and say to my bosses, what's that stuff on the back of the uterus? It would have a sort of a moth-eaten appearance. It was like plaques of white stuff and then sometimes bits of um, mucus dripping off the back of the uterus. And that's another sign I look for for adenomosis in, in particular. Um, so um, why, I may have missed some things there, but why, why do people, um, why do they get adenomosis? Well, it's probably exactly the same as why do they get endometriosis? Most, most diseases nowadays, we know that they're actually genetic and there's eight or nine genes that have been found um, uh, that are associated with, with endometriosis. And I, I actually helped with a study to, to, which I'm sure is not completed yet, to get specimens of blood, endometrium, and, um, and curettings, like scrapings of the inside lining of the womb that are still frozen at the Wesley um, uh, Research Institute. And I was doing samples of, for people that just had endo, just had adeno, and people that had both. And, and to try and sift out which genes are due to endometriosis and which genes are due to, or, or bring on adenomosis is gonna be a difficult one, but it'll be something genetic. Now, it's a bit like heart disease or arthritis. You might have the gene for um, you might have the gene for endometriosis or adeno, but you mightn't necessarily get the disease, which is why sometimes, you know, you'll have the great grandmother might have the, the um, might have had terrible periods, not diagnosed, then the mother had the endometriosis diagnosed and the daughter comes in. Well, got, I did. Oh, yeah. You'll get someone come in and that, um, that they you know, it might miss a generation sort of thing, but they still carry the gene. And, and certain factors, uh, usually some sort of stress, I don't necessarily mean mental stress, but some stress on the body will activate that gene and allow it to um, uh, alter things that happen in the uterus or in the end or in the peritoneal cavity so that the changes do occur. Um, so we don't really know what causes it, but there are theories about not, not only genetics, there's theories about instrumentation of the uterus, like if you have a lot of curettes, and, and people do do a lot of curettes by themselves or used to, not even do laparoscopies for heavy periods, which were presumably due to, due to, due to adenomosis. So instrumentation or damage to the inside lining is a possibility. Caesarean sections where you put a cut in the uterus and you almost... Uh, inject for want of a better word the endometrium in the muscle so that that can that will grow in the muscle from there on um, there are there's a theory about um, 
primitive cells called stem cells, and there's a lot of them in the bone marrow, but every tissue has its own stem cell to regenerate with. So the stem cells in the uterus may, may, be, may be inside the uterus from, from the embryonic stage, and then suddenly they get kicked on to have to being menstrual type of cells once the, once the woman starts having her pu first periods. So, um, so, that's, so, so what I do is if I see a patient that has symptoms of endometriosis or adenomyosis and there is a huge overlap, um, I will suggest to them not to go straight on the pill. Now, some people say, I'll oh, go on the pill. A lot of GPs just say, go on the pill. This, I, I don't agree with that. Uh, I would rather laparoscope someone and see the disease for myself. Have they got endo? Because you don't see end endometriosis on scan unless you miss the boat. Um, so we're looking to see, have they got endo? If they have, you cut it out. Have they got adeno? If they have, you get you then take pictures, serve the patient, and then what I do is I refer them on to a tertiary scanning facility. Now, when, when, I, when I say that, I mean a scanning facility that is not on every street corner. Okay, yeah, there's scans all around the place, scanners all around the place. But what, what I want is someone to look at the scan with, hopefully I'll send pictures along to that scanning person and say, either do an MRI for me or can you do a tertiary scan? In other words, do a tertiary level scan. So you're a specialist radiographer that has a special interest in endometriosis and adenomyosis. Uh, they know that that's what I'm looking for because that's what I put on the on the request form. Does this patient have any adeno? And then they will um, they will confirm or deny it. So so even though I see adenomyosis at laparoscopy and I'm pretty good and I'm not trying to you know blow my own trumpet, but I'm pretty good now at saying yeah that'll be adeno just by looking at the uterus. I can't say how bad it is usually, right? So I need to know is it mild, moderate, or severe? Is it uh, in the front wall of the uterus or just in the back wall of the uterus? Is it, uh, is it diffuse, meaning is it all through the whole uh, of the muscle of the uterus or is it localised? Is it to one area or another? Or is there a lump of adenomyosis? Just, just like you can get lumps of endometriosis, you can also get lumps of adenomyosis. Um, and they can look a bit like fibroids on scan, but the difference is this, the fibroid will have a capsule around it, whereas the adenoma will not have a capsule around it. And to try and remove an adenomyoma at surgery is a bloodthirsty kind of event. They're hard to get out because they've got no shell. Like a fibroid, you can shell them out. Adenomomas are, are difficult to shell out. So... Then, so I've just written a few notes here. The other thing I really want to talk about is the myth about age and, in, and both endometriosis and adenomyosis. Like we used to hear people would go to again, gynecologists and GPs and they say, oh, you're too young to have adenomyosis. Sorry, you're too young to have endometriosis. Most GPs and gynecologists now recognise that you can get it in your teenage years and, and lots of teenagers have endometriosis. However, we, like me, I was taught by by male and female gynaecologists in Australia and in England where I worked for, for a year or so. And in Cairns, I was all taught by, the, by people who had been taught by other people to, that, that, that adenomosis did not occur until you were in your 30s or 40s. And most of the time, it was diagnosed at hysterectomy. So um, about three or four years ago, I had to give a talk to some GPs and I did a literature search uh, on on adenomosis, <clears throat> and I was shocked to see that the same old garbage, in inverted commas, medical garbage, were being regurgitated and regurgitated and regurgitated. So people doing review papers on adenomosis will still put that it's co most common in the 30s and 40s. Yeah, it is, but they had very little mention uh, of people in their teenage years. Um, and I've got, I think my youngest 13, but I've got lots and lots of people, 14 and lots more at 15 and a whole heap between 18 and, and, uh, and 20. And just since November last year and now, I've got about 70 more people that are with, at, like proven laparoscopically and proven by scan. So I want to back up my laparoscopic findings. 70 more patients just in my practice in like whatever, whatever that is, six months or so, that have got adenomosis under 25. So that's just one doctor. Right, so there's a heap of it out there, and unfortunately, a heap of it's being being missed. So the real the, the myth that you have to be older to have adenomatous is is just that it's a myth. 
Um, and and today I saw someone that had been has had uh, period pain and all the other symptoms for 27 years. She's 42. Like it was just, I almost cried. She's 42. No one's ever taken her seriously. She'd been to heaps of GPs, specialists, outpatients, whatever. And um, you know, it's just, uh, it's almost a crime. Graham, Graham, can I just ask a question that we have come through in the chat um, twice now? So uh, two people have been uh, told that adenomyosis cannot be actually 100% di be diagnosed without a hysterectomy. What are your thoughts on that? Can you just comment on, on, that, the, on that? I think it's rubbish. <laughs> That's my comment. Um, and that's, that's typical of what we used to hear about endometriosis, you know, that, um, well, in the old days, you used to have a laparotomy to diagnose endometriosis and we only looked for black spots and that's why half of it was missed because it can be any colour you want to pick. Um, so I don't know who, like, who asked the question, but the answer from my point of view is that's rubbish and you, that you, they need to go back to their GP or specialist and say, okay, hang on a minute. Can you please refer me to a, a, um, a tertiary scanning person? Now, there's a, there's a few in Brisbane. The ones I prefer to use, can I name names or not really? Uh, we can send them around in a follow-up email. Yes, yes. Yeah. So there's, there's a lady in one back from Wickham Terrace that, that has done, uh, that does probably a couple of hundred scans of mine a year. And she does a full uh, small print report not a lot of, not a half a dozen line report that you'll get from the from the suburban some i better say some suburban scanners or you can have an, an mri done uh, at one of the bigger hospitals now i know that we i know that i've done a lot at wesley i know that brisbane private where <clears throat> some of my colleagues um that do ivf they use that that service up there but you've got it they've got to be they've got to be done in the late proliferative phase in other words you, have, you wait till your period's done, but you have it between your period, if it's a relatively short period, like say, if it's, a, if it's sort of less than seven days, sometimes in between seven days and ovulation, which is about 14 days. Now that doesn't help people on the pill because they've got no real cycle cycle, so that they could have that at any time. And um, <clears throat> uh, what else was I gonna say? Um, and some people are going to have much longer periods, so it's hard to pick a time if they're going to, if they have like periods that last 14 days, which some people with adenomyosis do. Does that answer the question? I think that's rubbish. Go back and see your GP and we'll get a second opinion or something like that. Um, so, so, the other, so what, what I want to divide, in, divide things into is that because we know adenomyosis can exist in young teenage women, girls or women, it can also and who don't want to have children and it also exists in that group who do want to have children and it also exists in the group of people who have had their children and don't want any more the, the treatment is therefore divided into treatment for young women middle age you know, not middle age but you know, the group in the middle that want to have kids or about to have kids and then later on so the treatment for for let's say uh, teenagers and early 20s that aren't wanting to have babies yet is going to be, be to preserve their fertility, which, which is what endometriosis surgery does too. You're trying to preserve their fertility. I, I'll, I'll just say something. I would much rather treat endometriosis than adenomyosis. Endometriosis is relatively easy to treat because you can cut the stuff out. You can see it. And if you know what you're looking for with all the different colors and look everywhere, you can cut it out. And, and you can debulk the, the body of disease and then try and stop the periods. If you've got adenomyosis, it's bloody hard. It's really, it's quite a difficult disease to treat because, um, you know, there's, there's um, everyone's a little bit different. The, you can't really tell him what you're trying to treat. There could be m much larger amounts of adenomyosis to treat. And you got another question or something, Jess? No? No, no, no. keep going. Yeah, um, so, so in the young women, I would say, let's make the diagnosis, have you got endo, have you got adeno, bilaparoscopy. Once we've made it, then say, okay, let's put you on a pill, progesterone dominant pill, such as Brevin or, or Norriman. Now, the problem is they're not available to August because they run out for some reason, but that's what I would normally do. And then we add in enough progesterone to, um, to stop their bleeding, right? Because you're not gonna get anywhere unless we stop the bleeding. 
To do that, by adding in more progesterone, of course, you get another problem that often these ladies are quite down and depressed and you know, why me sort of stuff and they're struggling with pain. And so adding in more progesterone in high doses and a high enough dose means that you, you may induce some emotional or uh, mood changes and you have to give them another tablet potentially to keep their mood stable. Otherwise, um, you know, you've got a second problem. This is why I say it's not easy. I have tried putting in marinas um, into young women. In fact, the first lot of two marinas I put in ever was about 10 years ago in a 15 year old lady that was just like, didn't know what to do with her. And I rang some colleagues in Sydney and they said, look, try two marinas. But two marinas in a teenager is not a good idea because the uterus is too small to take the two marinas. I'll get onto that later on. Um, so, <clears throat> so preserve fertility by using uh, by getting the diagnosis, putting them on the pill, putting them on progesterone tablets, uh, because we want to sort of uh, block estrogen receptors in the inner part of the uterus. The next, the next group of patients are the, are the sorts of patients who have symptoms of endometriosis or adenomyosis, and usually by the time I see them, if they're trying to have babies, uh, they've been through a year or so of trying to have children and, and they haven't been able to succeed. So we do a scope. To, see if they've got endo, check their tubes, diagnose how to know or not. And those patients, you, you don't want to stop their periods for too long because they're trying to get pregnant. So they're the sort of patients where uh, we might use a short burst of something like uh, Zolodex or, or Cinerol. A, a medicated IUD won't work quickly enough in these people who are trying to get pregnant. So Zolodex is a little, I'm assuming some people don't know what it is. So Zolodex is a little pellet that goes under the skin on the belly once a month for six months normally, but I would bring it back to two or three months of treatment if someone's trying to have a, a baby. Why would we do that? Adenomosis, um, uh, adenomosis is pretty well recognized by people that know a lot about adenomosis and endometriosis around the world, uh, it's known to interfere with fertility. And the way it interferes with fertility is that you've got the uterine artery, then you've got a, a group of arteries called the radial artery, then springing off from them, you've got some arteries called the spiral arteries. They're the ones that um, supply the, the fetus uh, er, you know, early on and, and kickstart its growth. So those spiral arteries are thinned down which they are in adenomosis, um, then people either don't get pregnant, they have recurrent miscarriages, or they have small for gestational age babies, like little runty babies, they come into prem labor, etc., etc. There's a few things. And the guy that I, I don't, that, that I follow loosely is a guy in Belgium called Brosens, who, who has written a lot. If you look up Brosens, B-R-O-S-E-N-S, he's written a lot about adenomosis. He, he's drawn a pretty good diagram to say, okay, if, you're, if, you, if your spiral artery should be that round, well, in adenomosis, they get thinned right down. But it's a reversible change in those spiral arteries by giving people Zolodex as a medication or Cineril, which is squirt up your nose, you can reverse that change so that the arteries that are gonna supply the fetus or embryo are, are the right size again. Now, I won't go into the, all the side effects of Zolodex at the moment, but that's what certainly I do if, I'm, if I've got a patient that maybe hasn't been able to get pregnant, give them a short burst of, of, of Zolodex. And then we get a window of maybe six months where those arteries, are, the changes in the arteries are reversed and they're more likely to get pregnant. If people have multiple IVF cycles by, at another unit um, uh, and we diagnose adenomosis usually by, by, by just a scan. I don't even do a laparoscopy. If we, if we have people who've had multiple IVF cycles, and I've had people who've had nine IVF cycles and no one ever scoped them, it's just sad. Like we do, we diagnose the adeno, we give them a short burst of, of Zoldex, and more often than not, they will get pregnant. Not everyone does, there's other reasons for, for not getting pregnant, but you know, that's, that's, um, that's how, how I treat that middle group. The third and then once that group has had babies, I suggest to them, once they've had a baby, that we then put two marinas into their uterus, right? Provided there's no contraindications and they haven't had one, they didn't like it before, that sort of thing. Uh, I then, after the baby, put two marinas in 
uh, if they've got adenomyosis at 12 weeks when the baby's 12 weeks of age. Why do I do that? That's the time while, while their pregnancy and breastfeeding has still had, a, had done some good for their adeno and they haven't had a period again. In other words, they haven't ovulated. This is assuming they're fully breastfed. So you want to get the marinas in and working before they start ovulating again. Once they start ovulating, you're producing more estrogen and then having you have periods and then the whole cycle um, starts over again. Um, this is just my suggestions. People can have a marina or not have a marina. I'm just saying what I often do. And then once, and then that stays in for a year or two and they want to get pregnant again, you pull the marinas out. Um, one of the things I do do if I use a marina is I suggest people take the pill as well. Just the lowest dose possible pill with the marina in to stop them ovulating as well. Because if you, people, if, because there's this nuisance side effect that happens with marina, marinas, um, and that is 7% of them will get a, an egg cyst that kind of doubles or triples in size. So a normal egg cyst is when it gets up to two and a half centimetres. But for some reason that I don't understand, 7% of people, and it's well known that this happens, 7% of people with a marina will get a big egg cyst and you get a different, different reason for the pain. They don't need an operation for it, um, but they do get a lot of pain from this. So then the third group, so we've gone through teenagers that might have had no, we've got people who want to have babies and how to treat them before they have a baby and then after they've had a baby. Um, now, then the third group is a person that might be, um, let's say 42, uh, or let's say 44, where pretty much it's going to be hard for them to have a baby. Um, I mean, I could pick 42 or 43 or 44, so I'm sort of, I don't want to be too sort of cruel to people, but by the time you get to 44, you're probably over, realistically. So at that age, um, the treatment is often different, and, and traditionally that treatment in that older age group of women has been have a hysterectomy. Because by definition, if you take the uterus out, you've cured them of adenomyosis, right? Now, that's not saying anything about endometriosis. Doing a hysterectomy doesn't necessarily cure endometriosis. I'm just honing on adeno. Adeno, you take the uterus out. You, by definition, you can't have adeno more, anymore because adeno is only in the uterus. So, but there is another, there is another way to treat people if they don't want to have it. And, I, and I'm not saying take ovaries out. You don't want to take ovaries out unless you have to. There's another way to treat um, women that have adenomyosis uh, that doesn't involve a hysterectomy, um, but that's still surgical. And that is pouring out the inside lining of the uterus. And that's called a hysteroscopic because it's done through a hysteroscope looking up into the uterus. Um, uh, but using an operative hysteroscope, not a diagnostic one. And you basically use a, a, an insulated wire loop to core out the whole of the inside lining of the uterus um, down to a depth um, that, that the surgeon is, is happy to go to safely. Now, this is different to an endometrial ablation. Um, an endometrial resection, I learned it in England in 1989, and it's actually quite a dangerous operation if you know what you're doing. I've perforated two uteruses in my life. The first one I did was, was at this operation was in 1989 in England, and I put a hole through a GP's uterus and she needed a hysterectomy as an emergency. And then when I'd done about 400 of these hysteroscopic endometrial resections, uh, not ablations, um, I, I did another perforation. So they, it, it's not without risk. The, Endometrial ablation, the instrument for that just kind of sears the inside edges, if you like, and you can use various uh, energy modalities to do it, but it doesn't cut out the inside lining. So what I'm talking about is literally cutting out all the endometrium, the, the bit that normally sheds, and then going much deeper with this little wire loop that's about half a centimetre in diameter, and coring it down to about half the width of the uterus, and then probably the best thing to do is to put a marina in to try and stop any regrowth. Not everyone wants a marina. So what I do there is I do an endometrial resection, cutting it down, and then I use a special instrument called a roller ball, which is a ball that rolls over and kind of sears the inside lining of the womb. And, get, and you get a bit more depth out of that as well. So you go deeper with, with your operation than you, than you would feel safe to do. So that's why a lot of people have endometrial ablations and it doesn't work very well. Um, now, 
you can't treat everyone with a hysteroscopic endometrial ablation, uh, sorry, hysteroscopic endometrial resection because some women have full thickness adenomosis. You can't, so if you try and get it all out, you're going to perforate the uterus and it's dangerous. So, um, and with all of that group, any, whether it's a teenager, whether they're trying to have babies, whether they're trying to have, uh, you know, conserve, conserve the uterus, you could add in things like any, any type of high dose progesterone will do the same job. In other words, you give them enough progesterone, they'll stop bleeding. Now, what's the problem with that? Well, the problem with that is that if you give people really high dose progesterone, they're going to get a whole heap of side effects with the progesterone. Uh, bloating, their bowels will slow down, um, so they might feel quite moody and depressed, um, the vaginal skin can thin down, you know, so there's no perfect treatment for endo and there's no tr perfect treatment for adenomosis either. Um, what else are we going to talk about? Graham, do we know if there's any effect on IVF and pregnancy with regards to adenomyosis? Well, depends on which IVF group you ask. I'll just move my screen and please talk to me. Depends on which IVF group you ask. I have heard people that are in Brisbane that do IVF get up at conferences and say things like, there is no proof that adenomosis causes infertility, right? And that might be true. There may not be any proof proof, like medical proof means you do a good double blind crossover study on them. It's really hard to do that on someone that's trying to have a baby when they all know that they've got adeno and they all know what treatment is going to happen. Um, it, it's kind of, you just can't do it. But um, if you read enough of the people that know a lot about adenomosis uh, in the literature, it's a pretty, it's a pretty fair bet that it's going to contribute. And I, and, and I see a lot, now this isn't a medical study, but I, this is anecdotally, I see a lot of patients that have got numerous failed IVF cycles you treat their adenomosis, they get pregnant pretty quickly. Um, but I didn't make that treatment up. This is like Brosens and his colleagues made, made that particular treatment up. And there's another, another study in um, the Australian Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology from about 2011 that has a picture of an adenomyotic uterus. And when I saw that adenomyotic uterus, I thought, oh, that's what I do. And, uh, and they just, they have a little protocol that they use. And we use the same thing where you put them on the Zolodex, press their periods for two or three months, give them a dose of steroids uh, until 15 weeks of pregnancy. And um, uh, what else do we do? We give them like estrogen to support the endometrium as we kickstart the, the uh, pregnancy. And we give them progesterone pessaries. Now, so, so there's, there's kind of recipes to, uh, that we use in IVF. Now, some of the IVF units around Australia and around the world uh, shareholder driven they want as many cycles as possible so i'll let you work out what i mean by that i'm not going to mention that so so i know it works in a lot of patients um that, that little treatment recipe uh, the reason to give them steroids is that when people have adenomosis they've got endometrium in the muscle the body says you in the muscle shouldn't be there right you don't belong in the muscle you belong in the endometrium so they mount an immune response if you look at a, and, and they, they churn out a whole lot of foreign body scavenger cells called macrophages. So macrophages are there to mop up stuff that's foreign, shouldn't be there. They just, in, in macrophages are cells that engulf foreign material and destroy it. Now, if you go and put an embryo into a uterus that's full of macrophages, guess what? The embryo gets, gets destroyed or the, the macrophages try and destroy the embryo as well. So that's why there's a high chance especially in bad animo that people won't get pregnant or they'll have recurrent early miscarriages so what was the question does it contribute i'm yeah i'm, I'm absolutely certain that it contributes to infertility was there another part of the question uh in pregnancy so but you've touched on that one well, as well pregnancy is it, yeah, they're at risk of going into prem labor prem rupture of membranes and having small babies and i've got a patient she might even be on the line at the moment on here at the moment but I've got a patient at the moment who has well-documented adenomosis. And at present, she's 31 weeks pregnant and she has a baby on the 10th percentile, um, maybe due to adenomosis. I mean, she certainly had adenomosis, so maybe that's the reason. Um, so we'll have to watch her very carefully that we get the baby out in time. That's, that's not a medical study though. No. 
And that's really why it's so important to have the right team around you that knows what they're doing or, or have some plans in place to really um, foresee what we could do if, if we do run into trouble. And I think that's why a lot of patients really uh, respect what you do there, Graham. Just going back to the mix of, uh, to all of the hormones that you've just spoken through with each of the groups, how do you know and work through the, the mix of hormones for each individual? Everyone is so different with their height and their weight. Is there a formula that you use or, or is there a method to your madness, I guess? The, me the method, the end point should be stop the periods. That should be the end point. Now, with adenomosis, we might stop the periods. In other words, we don't see any blood coming through the vagina, but the symptoms can go on for longer. It's just a, it's a pain for the women, right? And it's really hard for us as gynecologists, even though we know that the adenomosis is there, they still get pain. And the way I kind of would describe it for these women with adeno, forget it, I'm forgetting about endo, with adeno, is imagine that you've seen a footballer on TV get kneed in the in the thigh, right? That creates a big bruise in the muscle of the thigh and they call it a corky or a cork, right? So can you imagine in your uterus if you have numerous little bruises or lumps of blood or blood blisters that are all still kind of causing, uh, they're all kind of being contributing to little bits of pain but all over the uterus. Until all that stuff gets shriveled up and is, and is eaten away by your body, and that only will happen once you start stopping periods, um, you know, the symptoms will go on. So to get back to your question, how do we know what to start with? What I start with is I, if, I'm, if I'm using a marina, I'll then use a, try to use a progesterone pill, dominant pill, uh, and then I'll add in one or two primer loop, which is, a, which is called norethistrone, or you can use Provera. My, my favourite is primer loop, a little white tablet that you can take at the same time with the pill. And <clears throat> excuse me, then you just wind the dose of that up if you need to. Now, some people don't need a high dose. They can get by with the pure and one or two prime loop and that's fine. Some people though, uh, and I've got a few young, like when I mean young, I mean students at, at uni still that I've had where they've needed um, uh, a couple of marinas and Zolodex to, to really change their adenomosis um, and, you know, a, some of them have now gone and have had babies, but it's really different. No, no one person, you can't say here, take this like an antibiotic out of the effects, it doesn't work that way. It's winding the dose off. Of, and sometimes you put people on a group of hormones like the pill and, and progesterone and they say, no, I feel terrible. You just have to change it. Sometimes you put a marina in and they say, I hate this thing, it's awful. You have to change it. Sometimes I have gone, I've gone through like 10 years of putting two marinas in occasionally you see two marinas will, will, will wrestle with each other almost. And I think I know why now. So that you put two marinas in and, you, and I do it myself and I know that I've checked the position and that they're certainly in the uterine cavity. Why is it that some people end up with one or two uteruses, one or two um, marinas with the strings stuck right up back up inside the uterus where I know I've cut them two or three centimetres long? I think what it is is that the adenomosis causes a dysfunction in the uterine muscle, right? So there's actually three layers of muscle. If you're in labor, you're contracting the three different muscles, muscle layers. So they, they, you know, one goes sideways, one goes up and down, one goes obliquely, I think it is from memory. But there's a dysfunction of that. So uh, the strings virtually get stuck, sucked back up inside the uterine cavity. That's the theory, but I've seen it enough times to think, eh, why is this only happening in the adeno? Myosis patients. Um, and I saw another patient recently where one of the marinas had literally done a somersault. In, like, I'm not trying to turn off people off marinas. I think they do a great job, like 95% of the time, but weird things happen when it's, we're put in for adenomyosis. Where one of, the, one of the marinas had done a somersault, and when I looked in there, one was pointing one way, one was pointing the other way. And I know that they were, in, I put them in, I know they were both put in the correct way. So that's what else is left the uterine muscles. No. Even the patient can put one the wrong way. Yeah, you know, like if they fiddle with the strings, that's not going to do it. So something weird's happening. Just on that point of marinas, how do we know? And what's the time frame? Is there a time frame that we can give it some time to settle in? Because I know a lot of people with marinas 
they can for the first few months be a bit uncomfortable and have some bleeding. How often do you, um, you know, what would you suggest people, how, what period of time would you suggest people give it and what are the symptoms or I guess the, the telling signs that they need some medical advice, urgent or come back to see their gynae? Yeah, so come, come back a bit. There, are, there is a group of people that have a marina in where they haven't got a diagnosis. Right? They've been put in by the GP for heavy periods. Right? I don't think that's right. I know the GPs, I'm not trying to knock GPs, they're trying to do the right thing. If you just put a marina and say, oh, I can't, you'll be right. It's a bit like putting endometriosis with people on the pill forever and just saying you'll be right. You're not. So, so if, we, if, if we know the diagnosis, and let's say we know that it's endometriosis has been relatively minor, we've cut that out. The adenomyosis is relatively minor but still proven, and we put a marina in, usually for time for laparoscopy, uh, I would say to them that it's going to be about three to four months before the thing settles in, right? Now, uh, that's the hardest time for women if they are going to, to have a marina in that may last for four or five years. It's the hardest time because in that time, they'll have the symptoms that they actually came with. They'll have bleeding and they'll have pain. And sometimes the, sometimes the pain actually gets a bit worse, believe it or not, in some women, right? So... So three or four months, uh, stretch it to six months, but it's what it should be doing is it should be going down, right? The pain might be intermittent and it will be intermittent for the first month, but even the, 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 the periods between pain, which can be quite severe and going up through the vagina into the uterus, that should gradually get better and, and less frequent, right? I think that putting people on the pill at the same time of Marina, provided they're, they're okay with the pill, makes them helps them settle in a little bit more easily um in yeah. fever with the myrena should people be experiencing fevers or or anything like that you, you shouldn't get a fever fever right go and get a corona test but like you shouldn't i'm joking you shouldn't get a fever but people can get kind of hot flushes which is a symptom of zolic so get short sharp flushes of higher temperatures i think what that is is probably a bit like what happens in pregnancy. When, preg when pregnant ladies have their little practice contractions, they get a contraction on their uterus and it forces blood into, the, into their circulation. You'll see them, they'll have a flush for a little while. Uh, in, I think it's the uterus contracting on the marina doing a similar sort of thing. Now, obviously, the amount of blood that gets forced into their system isn't the same. may not be the same reason, I don't know. But uh, they shouldn't get a fever. If they're getting a the fever, no, that's not right. They could get a short, sharp flush, maybe, but not a fever. So, they, and the other thing, of course, if someone has a marina, and you've got to make sure that they know don't get chlamydia, right? Because a foreign body in the uterus with chlamydia is bad news. So, um, yeah, that's a reason for fever, perhaps. And so, you've spoken uh, a few times around having two marinas. Can most gynies insert the two marinas? Oh, look, technically, any gynecologist could put two marinas in. But you wouldn't want to. You don't want. You don't want to do that in your office. Like that's. I hardly do any in my office. I'll do some, but my little rule is people have to have a vagina, have had a vaginal birth, and really want it in in the office. Um, the few that I put in in my office usually they're people that have had them in before, and they say, oh, "I'm fine, don't worry." And if they're fine, that's fine. But because to put a marina in in the office, you've got to put a speculum in. Put some local anaesthetic in the in the cervix. Put a uterine sound, like a bit of like a like a, um, a metal instrument into the uterus while they're awake to find out how, you, how long the uterus is. Then put your marina in, and and like it's not nice. It's you know it's it's unpleasant to watch the ladies go through pain for me. God only knows what they're going through. So that's just my point of view, right? Other people might want to put them in the office. That's fine. They can do it. Um, I'm just saying what I do now. Um, what was the question again? Haven't answered it quite completely. No, you've answered that. Um, how do we get them out? So most of the time, you should be able to put do a speculum examination, see the strings. The doctor grabs hold of the marina strings with a little pair of um, sponge holders, which are just grasping forceps, and and then say, okay, are you ready? You're going to have a short, sharp pain. You pull, and they come out, and the patient will, and then lie down for five minutes while you recover because you'll get a few crampy pains. But it should be able to be done in the surgery, except if the strings have disappeared, one or both of them. 
And that's just the pain in, in the neck when that happens for the patient because you've got to take them to theatre and get it out. But the same happens with any sort of IUD, not just marinas. Um, if, that, if the marina gets, if the string disappears north, then there's only one way to get them out. There used to be, I used to in my office have a, a, an IUD marina, uh, an IUD uh, removal instrument that Eva Poppy, Popper, who has since passed away, gave to me in about 1984 or something. But that was specifically designed to remove a huge IUD called a Lichty's loop, but we don't have them anymore. So don't try. Don't try it at home. Don't try it at home. Moving, uh, switching gears slightly, a few people have asked about Vizan. What are your thoughts and experience with Vizan? Yeah. So, look, when I, I got a bit annoyed with Vizan, the company, because they bombarded us with so much advertising material like stuff that comes across your desk like it was like for weeks and weeks and i thought god this is a lot of stuff now it but it does work it works about as well as zolodex in about half the population so if people have been on the Vizan, i'll give it to them if they want it i'll give it to them but i'll say look see how you go and if they're fine they're fine good um it's a bit like marina if it works use it if it doesn't it's not suitable for you it just that's that's fine they it just it got very popular because now let me get this right because of a pop singer i think in canada originally like that's how, how they kind of market it everyone wanted it because this lady had it i can't remember who it was but and i thought oh, okay it's just another one of these things that's going to come through and, and be a bit of a fad but it stayed longer and it works i don't use it a lot but i don't offer it a lot but i'll use it if people have had it before Graeme, is there any, in your opinion, is there any association between adenomyosis and pelvic congestion? Um, yeah, a bit. Pelvic congestion syndrome is really a syndrome where people get varicose veins, predominantly varicose veins in their pelvis. So you can diagnose them on MRI or scan, or you can see them at laparoscopy. And some people have big knotty veins next to their, next to their uterus in their ovarian vein plexus and you think god that must be uncomfortable and often they'll feel heaviness they'll feel, feel, feel a heaviness in the pelvis so that's pelvic vein, that's um, pelvic congestion syndrome per se however people that have got adenomosis have got a big uterus that's full of blood right so that, that's why they call the bulky uterus very often so they are going to feel in, they're going to feel um congested in their pelvis and they often do and they'll often say i feel heavy i feel pressure on my bowel um, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there's a, it's a bit like saying you've got irritable bowel syndrome versus you've got a, a bowel which is being irritated by endometriosis or adenomosis. Or the, this is my opinion, and I think it's probably right. In other words, a lot of people are misdiagnosed as irritable bowel syndrome when they're having periods with flooding and, and, and clots. Well, that's not irritable bowel, that's a period problem. But endometriosis releases some hormones, which does give them um cyclically some diarrhea and then the other times of the cycle they got constipation so they often get constipated leading up to a to a period and then they get diarrhea when their period starts or just before it starts so that is a bit like irritable bowel but it's the endometriosis uh being irritated and then they'll go to gastroenterologist and they have a colonoscopy and they're all normal and the and you know the same you know the story like they'll often get two laparos two colonoscopies before they get a laparoscopy um, now, however, the diagnosis of irritable bowel syndrome does exist. Right? It's not that there's no irritable bowel syndrome, it's just that it's overdiagnosed with people with menstrual dis dysfunction due to endo and adeno. And uh, any connection between endo cell pingosis and adenomyosis? So, endo cell pingosis. Thank you. <laughs> is, a pathology, no, sorry, is a pathologist's word. And I, when I first saw it, I don't know, in the early 90s, I rang the pathologist up and I said, what do you actually mean by this? And I got a vague, a vague kind of answer to say, well, it might be a, a, pre, a precursor to endometriosis. Sometimes what, what I'll do is I'll cut out stuff, in inverted commas, endometriosis, that looks, that looks not quite like endo, but it's certainly abnormal. So I'll cut it out and it'll come back that there's a mixture between endometriosis and endosalpingiosis. So, 
I'm sure it causes pain, but it's not quite the same as endometriosis per se. Now, is there an association between adeno and endocelp ingestus? Um, well, only in terms of the fact that they often, that endo and adeno often coexist, or so do endocelp ingestus and endometriosis coexist, and yes, you, and yes, sometimes endocelp ingestus and endo and adeno all coexist. Um, I think it's a little bit of a label that some of that some of the pathologists might put on it if it, it doesn't quite meet the criteria of um, endometriosis. And going going back to uh, the MRI again, do we need to have them checked? So, well. The, oh, sorry, not MRI, the, Marina. Um, well, I check them at about six weeks just to make sure they're still in the uterine cavity. And then I, and I used to say, come along at a year and come along every year to have another scan. And like people just didn't come. If they were, they'd come if they had a problem, that's great. But if they, they'd just come back at five years and say, I've been fine, can I have another one in? Um, so I do check them at six weeks to make sure they're in the uterine cavity, make sure the strings don't need trimming. So I tend to leave them a bit longer now so that there's less chance of them disappearing north, the strings. But after that, I just leave them alone. And really, if, you, if they're in the uterine cavity, um, the only drama, and they can be still working even if the strings disappear north, the, dr the only drama is at the other end of it, the five years, you're going to have to have a brief anesthetic to take a, have one taken out and put back in again. Right. So, um, so is that what you mean by check? Like, yeah, can you, I guess, can you check the progress? Well, can you check their progress? Are you able to thing, have a scan to see if they are, have been effective for adenomyosis? Yes, but don't have it too early. But, I mean, they, they, they will take a while to settle in like, you, you're waiting like maybe four to six months, as I just said before, max, six months max, but certainly four months before the bleeding even stops and, and the crampy pain um, calms down. I usually say to people, if they want to have a check one, have it in about a year. Now, can I just also comment, between about 2009 or 10, I, and, and last, and early last year, I was only really using MRI scans to diagnose adenomosis. Like, but I thought people have adenomosis laparoscopically. I got an MRI scan to check them. And, and there were probably four or 500 that I did in that year, in, the, in those years <clears throat> of MRI scans to, checking, to check the, how much. During that time, what, you, what are you actually looking for in an MRI scan? You're looking for something called the transformation zone. So the transformation zone is the zone between the endometrium and the muscle, right? between the lining of the womb, the sheds and the muscle. And that zone should really only be between about five and seven millimeters thick. At that time, it started off, they, around the world, they had it, that it was, if it was nine millimeters or more thick, that was the diagnosis of adenomosis. And then it changed to 12 millimeters. So someone on an MRI scan can measure, if they know what they're talking about, or if they know what they're looking for, they can measure the, the thickness of the junctional zone. And if it's more than 12, by definition, that is adenomosis. And I was, we were going on really well. And then the two major girl, radi female radiologists that were doing it at Wesley where I worked, they went and worked somewhere else in the hospital, breast clinic or something like it was. And we got guys looking at it. And it was a real shame because the guys, and I was down there looking behind them with photographs of what I thought was adenomosis laparoscopically. And they, what the first thing they did was what? Look at the date of birth of the patient, right? You've got to have a look at the date of birth of the patient in anyone to get a, to get a rough guide. But they were saying, no, nah, she's too young on MRI scan and we're calling it repeatedly. So that's when I changed over to the ultrasonographers that I use. I've still done a few MRIs because people have had them in the past. So I'm using scanning people more and they've got their own criteria. And I can't remember exactly what they look for, but they, they all say yes or no. I can diagnose that now most of on my own office scanner if it's if it's there now, but I want someone that's that's really a qualified scanner to to look at it. And you, in the office scan with a vaginal vaginal scan, you just see little white blotches all over the uterus or in the area that you you know that it occurs usually posterior uterus is more than anterior. So getting back to the question, should you have a follow up scan? Yeah, especially if you. Um, I've had a lady recently. 
from Ipswich. She's only 20 odd and she had an MRI a year ago and then had another one. Uh, no, no, she had a scan a year ago when I diagnosed her. No, she had another one. And despite being on the pew and the marina and progesterone, her adenos got worse. Right. So you've got to know, is, are we doing any good? Because if you're not, you need to move on and do something else. Like put her on Zolodex or something. Work through that. We have a question here. Just wondering what you would recommend for pain management aside from pelvic floor physio, diet, etc. So in terms of medication for pain management for adenomyosis. Yeah. Look, um, adeno pain can be pretty terrible, right? Don't don't sort of yeah. It's not like oh you cut your endo out, you should be a lot better. If you got if you've still got uterine contractions due to adenomyosis, you're gonna need some pain management of some sort. Now one of the problems that I see often, I mean, I'll answer the question in a minute, but one of the problems I see often is that people turn up at public hospitals, get seen by a junior resident or a registrar, or maybe even an outpatient by a consultant that hasn't got a special interest in adeno, and they're brushed off, or probably worse, they're given uh, painkillers like endone or like panadine or like something else that's going to be addictive and that'll give them short-term relief um, but not long-term relief so there's a few other combinations that I'll try first so um, initially I would try if, if the marina's just been put in or if they haven't tried it try uh, a naproxen which is an anti-inflammatory naproxen slow release depending on the the lady, how old she is, maybe 750 or 1,000 milligrams once a day. But you really shouldn't use it long term because it can rot your gut, like you would get an ulcer from it. So you, if you're going to use it more long term, you need to have something like Nexium, uh, which is um, which will prevent that happening. Um, but if, you, if you're needing naproxen slow release for more than a couple of months, you know, I'm not happy with that. You know, there's something wrong. Um, so, um, you can use it intermittently. You might want to use some naproxen and Panadol together and, nep and Nexium. So that's one little group of things of, um, of analgesia. Um, and occasional endo, there's no, I've got no problem with that. Like if, you, if you're on something else and you wake up and you have some endo, we yeah, like to knock it on the head, get you some sleep, not as a sleeping tablet, but, but that's okay, sort of. What I've started to use is... Um, is a drug, or the anesis initially started using it, but there's something called Polexia. Polexia is, um, is a not much less addictive and it comes in um, 50 and 100 milligram tablets and it, cause it's a slow release that lasts for 12 hours. So you'd have one dose in the morning, one at night time. Um, you start off at 50, increase to 100 if you need to. And then if you get breakthrough pain at mid With, with as well. Now you can also use um, you can also use paracetamol regularly with it, right? Paracetamol by itself doesn't do much, but if you get if you can have a few things at once, you know some of these drugs at once. If you need it, this is if you need it only, then that's helpful as well. Um, suppositories, an anti-inflammatory suppository of one type or another might help. Uh, some type people find that that's helpful. There's no blanket. There's no band aid. Like it was, sometimes it's just a band aid. There's no quick fix for everybody. Sometimes you just have to try a different thing. And, and I've got like quite a few patients that end up going to the pain clinic if they need to. So if people are addicted to drugs, I shaft them off to a pain clinic pretty smartly. Not shaft them off, but send them off. Um, now, and, uh, and when you say, and when you say addicted to drugs, where we're, we're yeah. really talking. Endone is like not a good drug, but it gets, gets, gets dished out at public hospitals a lot. Right. So you've got to be really careful. Same with panadine. The reason people don't give panadine anymore, I mean, I will occasionally, but, you know, I've had professional women come in like over the years and say, I need more panadine, need more panadine, like scary stuff. You know, they're going to get addicted. That's what people were you know, killing themselves in America from, from codeine addiction. Um, Fentanyl is another one. You can have fentanyl patches, but that's also addictive. So you've got to be careful. That's the sort of stuff I would prefer to give to a pain clinic to look after. Now, just getting back to pelvic floor physios, I worked at Wesley for a long time before I even realised that there was a decent pelvic group of pelvic floor physios there. And there is a really good group of pelvic floor physios at Wesley where I worked. There's another group that worked with Eve Health. 
Um, uh, and the way I would, if people said, oh, physio, what do I want a physio for? Well, let's just make it kind of simple. If you have pain in your pelvis, there are muscles in your pelvic floor that will say, brain, protect me. So your brain will send a message to the pelvis to quickly contract as a protection mechanism, right? And if it keeps doing that for long enough and um, you know, frequent enough, your pelvic floor muscles will be switched on to the extent that they're switched on all day long and, and you'll get an independent sort of pain. Um, I'm trying to sort of break this down, make it simple, but you'll get pain from the pelvic floor muscles and tiredness from the pelvic floor muscles. And the physios, what they do is they'll do a scan on the tummy and say, okay, look, your, your muscles are switched on. Let's teach you how to switch them off. Um, because there's, there's repercussions from having tight pelvic floor muscles, not just for pain, but like you might have pain with intercourse because the muscles are just going tight, you know, squeezing tight like that. So physios are, are great. The only problem is they can't do Skype physio that well. It's just no. at the moment, you know. And just, um, just to uh, give an update, the Eve Health Allied Health team uh, no longer work at Eve. So if people, yeah. the Eve Health Allied Health, um, oh. the physios at Eve Health, they no longer work right. there. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, so um, if anyone did uh, were seeing were seeing a physio at Eve Health, just to contact us and we can put them in touch with their physio. Yeah, she's got the person you're talking about is used to give some good reports and people used to like her. Ah, oh, okay. Yes, no, so they certainly are around and certainly are still practicing. They've just changed their um, their location. So if anyone did see them, don't don't stress. Just let us know and we can give you their new details. Um, just yeah. wanted to put that in there. So let's, let's, like, I know most about where I work, obviously, so I'm not sure where everyone else is tuning in from, but at Wesley, if I send someone down that has pain in their pelvis and I think they might have pelvic floor dysfunction, they will see a physio for assessment. Uh, and that usually involves, like, um, an explanation of why pelvic pain might happen because of the muscles. Uh, they will see, uh, if we ask for it, they'll see it pain pain psychologist to try and give them an idea of how they might cope with their pain. It's not going to be fixed in one visit. The physio won't, the psychologist won't, the gynecologist won't. And the other person that's helpful is an exercise physiologist. So the exercise physiologist gets word from the physio about what sort of exercises that lady needs to do or to train her train her pelvis right, to be switched off. But it's 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 a multiple visit thing. Now the unfortunate thing is that that costs money and if you haven't got insurance or if you haven't got the right insurance, some some of the um, insurance companies don't pay for it. So, um, you know, it can be an expensive exercise if you haven't got any insurance to, to go through that clinic. It's called the Wesley Rehab Clinic um, and they rehabilitate people in, in lots of ways um, from, um, you know, in terms of uh, you know, pelvic floor with dysfunction, people that lose legs, people have strokes, people have injuries, all that sort of stuff. But it's all, it's all in one little place, which is good. Mm. Wonderful. Graeme, thank you so much. We've, uh, we've worked through the questions that have come through in the chat. So uh, very appreci much appreciate um, your, so, your yes, time. You, you will know this, but I've actually just written an article for Doctor Magazine, which is a GP mag a, a magazine that goes out to I don't know three three thousand doctors every couple of months. I've just written quite a big article on adenomyosis, and I'll send you. I'm just correcting the my typing mistakes in it. I'll send you the copy of that in the next day or two. Wonderful. Graeme, thank you again. Do you have any closing remarks? Some people here. We've worked through teens to 20s 30s up to you know post um post child child bearing ages do you have any last comments for the for the group here well look this is the talk on adeno if you if you have symptoms of endometriosis and you have a laparoscopy and you don't get significantly better uh, after laparoscopy you should and, and you, especially if your gynecologist didn't even talk about the possibility of adenomyosis before they went in there, you need to think about, well, that might be why I've still got pain. But that's, that's what I'll say. Wonderful. Thank you again. All right, my pleasure.